Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Pieces Case Breakfast webinar. And it's my pleasure to host it as a CEO. So I'm Sean Blakely, and my role today is a very simple one, just to let you know some of the logistics, uh, explain the topic, and then pass it over to our fantastic moderator and speakers. So in it, so a big thank you to Sam for moderating, moderating also to Chewy, Graham, and Tia for, for being part of this. So it's my pleasure to have you here, and also my pleasure to welcome you guys. So just in terms of the some of the logistics, you'll see, depending on what type of device you're using and also what version uh, you've downloaded, you'll have a Q&A uh, somewhere on your screen. If you click on that, and actually Jongmin, who's just to the right of me, will, will prompt you to do so and, and highlight where that is, you can write a question. Uh, if you write a question, then you know we will try to address it most likely at the end, um, but depending on the volume of questions, we may not get to it, we will certainly try. And it may be that the speakers uh, refer to that as, as they're speaking, but most likely that will come at the end. But we do encourage you to, to, to ask some questions. The second thing is we will be recording this and uh, distributing the content as well. So just to sort of uh, bear that in mind. So without further ado, just to welcome the, the speakers and moderator. And today we have um, a great topic around the empowerment of the next generation of female business leaders, looking at awareness and, and knowledge gap for female professionals in, in terms of their career advancement, um, relationship capital gap, you know, as well as, and then also the value of mentorship or sponsorship, career aspirations, risk-taking gap, and also cultural challenges for both uh, for female pro professionals here, particularly in the Korean context, especially those aspiring to senior positions. And then finally, best practices uh, in terms of effective mentorship uh, for the next generation of female leaders. And so without further ado, I'd like to just pass it over to, to Sam. And uh, Sam, if you can maybe take it over from here. And Sam, as everyone knows, is a, a fantastic board member and also director of the British Council here in Korea. So over to you, Sam. Thanks, Sean. Thanks. Um, and first of all, just to thank our panel members today for, for coming and contributing to this webinar. Um, we're really excited to have you here. Um, if I can just briefly introduce the panel members, we have uh, Juhi Lee, who is the managing partner of Ling Lakers in Korea. Um, she's worked in Hong Kong and Seoul um, before becoming the national managing partner of the Link Lakers Seoul office. Uh, she's also a solicitor of England and Wales. Um, also, we have Graham Johnston, who's the Chief Risk Officer for HSBC in Korea. Um, he's held various uh, roles in his career, and he also has responsibility for uh, risk, wholesale credit, and collections and risk business management. And then finally, uh, Jihei Song, who is a, a professor at the Graduate School of International Studies at Iwa Women's University focusing on international communications and development communication. She's also uh, been the president and CEO of Erirang TV and radio, as well as the CNN's bureau chief and correspondent based in Seoul. So welcome everyone. Thanks again so much for, uh, for joining us. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of context. Uh, this is our second Women in Business uh, uh, webinar that we've held. The first one we held earlier this year on International Women's Day to open up the conversation about the lack of women and female executives in Korea and, and anything that we could do to, to change that moving forward. As uh, many of you might know, uh, Korea uh, has been ranked the lowest in the last eight years in the Economist Glass Ceiling Index, and it also has the largest pay uh, gender pay gap of all OECD countries. So um, that's the context in which we're approaching this. The BCCK set up um, the Women in Business Committee um, earlier this year to try and take a look at this, this area and to, um, to understand how we could contribute in making a difference. So before um, we get into the real topics, could I just ask the, uh, the panel members to briefly introduce themselves? And, and also just um, comment on the role of women and women leaders in that industry and how that may have impacted uh, their career. And, and just to, to comment also on whether they feel women are adequately represented 
in their particular industries. So uh, first of all, could I uh, go to Juhi uh, to, to respond to that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, hi, hello, everyone. I am, first of all, very delighted and honored um, to be participating um, in today's session. So thank you very much for, for inviting me, BCCK. Uh, my name is Juhi Lee. I'm a partner at Linklater Seoul. Um, so I head our um, Seoul office. I have been uh, with the Linklaters for 15 years now. Um, as Sam mentioned, I was based in Hong Kong, Linklaters Hong Kong, before we opened up our office in Seoul about seven years ago. Um, so I came back to um, Seoul then. I was born and raised mostly in Korea, studied law in Korea. Um, and, and so, but I've spent a couple of years um, in California when I was very young, um, hence, hence my Korean accented um, English. Um, so moving on to, I guess, the topic, um, Sam, whether I think uh, women are adequately represented in my sector. So in the legal industry, um, we have different disciplines. Um, so where I work is energy and infrastructure. So I do things like offshore wind, renewables, oil and gas, petrochemicals, etc. cetera. Um, as the topic suggests, it's very male driven. Um, so I think almost all of the senior lawyers that I have worked with and link leaders have been guys. Um, um, that said, I guess in the very recent years after I got promoted as, as a partner and I joined Asiacom, at link leaders. Um, so there I got to actually um, uh, see other female lawyers um, who are more senior than me. Our Asia managing partner was Natalie Hobbs, um, although it, um, she, she stepped down very recently. Um, so it was really great to see her. Um, I think it really depends on which work discipline you look at, but as a general statement, I think um, it's very male driven, the legal industry. I think it's mm. changing but probably not at a speed that I would like to see. Um, so yeah, I'll pause there. Brilliant, thanks so much. Graham. Thanks, Sam. And just to just to echo uh, Juhi's comments, thank you very much. I feel very privileged to, to, to be here um, included uh, as a panelist here today. Um, uh, my background is uh, I've been in financial services with HSBC for, for um, 20, 20 plus years, almost 20 years now. Um, I've worked in six different geographies. I'm originally, um, originally Canadian. Uh, prior, to, prior to coming to Korea, I worked for um, uh, quite possibly, and, I, and my boss might be listening, so I, I'll have to say, my current boss might be listening, so I have to say, my pr previously my, the best leader I'd ever worked for, but um, sh she was a, a real inspiration. She led a scale business of, uh, of, of 5,000 colleagues for HSBC in the UK, um, and it was at that point when I kind of connected the dots between my own personal uh, motivations and, and, and interest in, 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 in caring for and developing um, female leaders in the financial services industry with what I could clearly see as the, the professional reason as well. And I've, I've had the privilege of being influenced my own life um, from, from wonderful women, from my mom and my stepmother and, and, and all from an early age. Um, and then all of a sudden I saw the power of what that can look like in a, in a, in a scale operation where um, you know, probably un, not unlike what Juhi described, the you know, financial services industry is, is, doesn't have that many um, uh, great and powerful um, uh, female leaders in it. Um, mm -hmm. And seeing how she led and how she brought others with her and how she inspired uh, to affect change was, was, a, was a big driver for me. Um, uh, both personally and professionally, and 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 that was sort of the mantle. And I said, well, if 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 she's going to be that representation for people in the UK, I I, I want to also try and go and help ignite that um, wherever I go next. And and I'm I'm pleased to say in Korea, I've wor I work with a, a a bunch of wonderful women leaders, um, both on our exco and and ac across the, our our business in HSBC that. Um, really makes it easy to be an ally to, to this uh, very important agenda. Brilliant. Thanks, Graham, very much. Thanks for that contribution. Um, and can I just ask Jihei to, to contribute? Yes. Hello. Good morning. I'm 
I'm going to echo my two predecessors saying I'm very privileged to be here. Thank you very much for the BCCK for organizing such an important event. Um, my name is Jie Sung, Sung Jie in Korean. Uh, I am currently a, a professor at UL Women's University, um, the world's, I think, second largest women's university. We have about 20,000 women um, studying in, in, our, in our campus, on our campus, now offline, but online, offline, uh, online, offline. Um, I graduated from IWA. I'm, I'm at like Juhi, bred and born uh, in Korea. I spent a, a couple more, out, more years than Juhi overseas, hence, uh, my Korean accent is a little less <laughs> than what Juhi said, but um, it, I am very Korean through and through. Uh, I was a journalist for most of my career. I spent 15 years as a CNN correspondent in Seoul, um, then moved over to government, worked for the government as spokesperson. So I, so I was able to, uh, to know the other side of the mic. Um, and now I also do communications consulting as well as teaching. In journalism, um, relatively to, relative to other industries, women are seemingly better represented. Um, when I entered journalism in the 1980s, that was actually one of the reasons I sort of started down the career towards um, foreign to correspondent journalism. Uh, women could only go into the culture desk. You know, if they were hired, that's all they could do. Um, these days, it, it is not the case. Women go into all different um, sectors, and there are more of them, and you see more of them on TV. But I am afraid that they, they are still not given the responsibility roles um, and move up the ladder the way that they should be. Um, and to be frank, a lot of them are considered eye candy. Um, and so it is still that the case. Just a while ago, even the just the two, three years ago, there was a big um, uproar or, or big uh, news story about, you know, a female anchor actually wearing glasses for the first time, which, which goes to show that, you know, women were considered um, much more for how they looked than actually what, what their um, capabilities were. And so, and especially on the top in terms of the executive level, I think there is a gross underrepresentation of women. Um, even with me as president of Arirang TV, which is one of the you know, big um, TV channels in Korea, um, I, I was the first female CEO and I'm still the only fem female CEO of a, of a um, relatively major TV uh, broadcasting station. So we still have a ways to go in journalism. I'll stop here, thanks. Brilliant, thanks so much, thanks so much. <clears throat> just moving on, um, I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about um, what many refer to as the awareness and knowledge gap and a view that, that perhaps male counterparts um, have a greater level of access to information about career paths that lead to the highest executive levels, the C-suite, um, than women do. <clears throat> Juhi, I, I just wonder if I could come to you and, and understand whether that's your understanding and based on your experience? And, and if so, why, why do you think that is? Um, personally, um, so, so I would like to share from two aspects, one personal and one I've seen, um, mm. not, not, not for myself. So personally, I have been very lucky. So all the senior partners that I've worked with, they have been great. Um, they have been super transparent. Um, um, so. Um, from the very onset, they shared what it took, what, what was required to become a partner at Linklaters um, and how, that, how we could make that happen. So we worked together, me and my sponsor partners, we worked together for more than five years to make it happen. Um, so, so I personally was very lucky, but I think I probably was an exception. Based on what I've heard in and outside the link theaters, I think um, guys, they network more, um, they talk to each other more, they share uh, more transparently. Um, and I, I, I think sometimes that happens not because they have any bad intention, but it just feels more natural to them. I think, you know, um, a guy would feel more, more um, comfortable speaking to another guy, um, 
um, over a glass of beer and so forth than um, to a female, right? Um, so I think it is true um, um, that, that because of how these guys naturally behave, women tend to get less information uh, as to how to get to the C-suite, so to speak. Um, so I, I do think it's true. Thanks so much. And 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 Gia, do you do you agree with that? Is that you has that been your experience? Um, yes, I totally agree with Chewy that that there is a different kind of culture among the male um, employees and among the female. I I call it a systemic. Um, you know, you know, in this U.S. they call mm. it systemic racism. It's a mm. systemic gender bias system in Korea. I mean, it, mm. it happens without people really understanding or knowing about it. So I think that's why it's very difficult. Um, I, I look at it from two ways. One, personally, um, because there are just a lack of female executives on the top. And so, you know, the, the, mm. the um, saying, you can't be what you can't see. I mean, you know, mm. young women mm. that are climbing up the ranks don't see female executives up there. And therefore, they feel like, you know, that's never going to happen. You know, those things don't go to, you know, girls and, and women like me. And so they and they that sort of limits their um, their their aggressiveness and their, you know, goals, I think. Um, so that's one. And then two is what, what Julie talked about in terms of within a, within a structure. Um, men have a certain kind of. Uh, you know, they used to call it the old boys club, um, yeah. but I, I've seen that at work. I've, I've, you know, I've, I've had even when executive level with other male executives, because I don't, I didn't know any female executives. I had no other female executives. I, I'm sure Julie doesn't know other female executives of her, of her level um, or not many anyway. Um, and I've seen other males, you know, when they got a call from somebody um, and this is a few years ago, so I'm sure it's less too, but um, saying that, oh, you know, a certain junior graduated from the same high school, um, same university has just gotten, you know, some a, a promotion within a certain, you know, other corporate that this co company deals with. They will get on the phone right away, send flowers, you know, their traditional flowers, send a note saying we shouldn't have lunch. You know, it, it, it's automatic almost. Um, the linkage of, you know, people um, in the male society, women don't think like that. Women think, oh, that's great. You know, maybe they'll send flowers, but they don't think of that as sort of a networking opportunity that comes up um, because we're not, we're not, we, I don't know, we've just weren't um, trained that way. We weren't educated in that way. And so it, it's a lack of that, I think, um, that, has sort of kept women on a certain level and and sort of um, limited them from rising above that level. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jihei. I think I mean just just going out to the panel and uh, generally, given that there seem to be so few role models for women to to look up to. Um, what do you think uh, you as senior leaders within your organizations, within your industry, can do to sort of bridge um, that sort of knowledge and awareness gap? And I wonder if I could just bring Graham in, um, first of all, um, on that question. Sure. Well, I think if I if just go back to one of the words that um, uh, GA mentioned is, is, is bias, right? And, and I think... Um, I think there, there are two aspects um, to, to, to try and kind of cast a light on, on, on a space that isn't always, we're not always aware of, right? So one is, one is um, you know, what can we do as an individual, uh, as an individual leader? And I think, you know, what, what, what we see at HSBC by way of example, we've, we've got a program, a balanced program, where we've got 85 colleagues out of roughly 500. We've got roughly 17% of our colleagues are, are dedicated to a group who are, and, and the, the, the ambition of the balance group is precisely to help um, develop female leaders in the organization. So that, that is also not just women, that about, that's about 60, 60 of them are women, about 25 are, are men. So there's a, there's a kind of very, very transparent, very visible commitment from individuals, um, both women in the organization, as well as men who, who should, be, should be allies. Um, 
to show people that, okay, I may not be someone who you see in yourself, but I can be someone who can help, help bring you along and, and someone who's committed to helping you along on that journey. Um, and then the second part is, 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 is a bit more structural and, and, and developing processes and procedures that do their best to try and stamp out. And you can't, I don't, I don't believe that you can fundamentally stamp out bias, but I think you can take a number of steps to try and reduce it and eliminate it. And, and, you know, if you, if I look at sort of our hiring practices and say, right, well, we, 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 we ensure that there is at least a, a female on the short list of candidates when they're going for, when they're going for jobs, we ensure that a panel of interviewers includes females on that on those interview panels and these aren't panaceas they're not they're not perfect there, there there are other kind of unintended consequences that arise from this but 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 i do think there there are at least kind of steps in the right direction structurally to try and mitigate some of the bias that exists and, and addresses some of the issue the issue of you know if you have all all you know three men interviewing for a role they're going to be carrying a significant amount of bias into that whether they realize it or not mm -hmm. Thanks, Graham. Thanks. And Juhi, I just wonder if I could just um, throw the same question to you. Sure. I, I mean, my thoughts are shockingly aligned with uh, what Graham just said. Um, so at LinkedIn, is, we take this very seriously. Um, so, and I think, I think as Graham said, it, 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 you know, it, the changes need to come at three different levels. So it's a very, and, and I think senior management needs to change. Right, because senior management often comprises mainly of male partners or male lawyers who are not aware of these, um, who are not aware of their own awareness, right? Um, so they do not know what they're doing or what they're not doing. And they, I, do, I do not think they would necessarily listen to very junior people. It actually needs to happen. The discussion needs to happen at the top among the senior people to make ourselves aware. So we have programs for that. Um, at the same time, I think we need to nurture our female, junior female um, lawyers. So for that, um, we have had this program called the Women's Leadership Program, where we identify you know, female talent and we nurture them from early ages as, as, as a lawyer. Um, so that's another another thing. Um, so similar to balance program um, that Graham mentioned. Finally, um, procedures and process as well. So, uh, as an example, you know when we when we uh, present a candidate for partnership, there there is a there there is this document, the business case and um, candidate profile that we need to fill in, and there is a section where we need to um, specify whether the candidate is a male or female. And if it's a male, whether there is a, a female associate um, who's at, at a similar level, who could also be eligible for this promotion. And we have to specify the reason for not promoting that person or promoting this person over the other. So I think that procedure and process. So through different levels and these procedures, I think we are enhancing gender diversity and ensuring that our junior female lawyers um, do stay with the link leaders until they become more senior. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Julie. GA, uh, I'll let sorry, you come in. I just, yeah, I, I'm just made a very quick point because mm. I loved when Julie said it, it, it's the problem of getting people to take this seriously. And I see this at the very top because whenever, you know, I talk to for example, government officials about like, like the foreign ministry, for example, until very recently they had no um, female ambassadors. So I, I, you know, I talked to like the um, foreign minister and say, you know, that, that's, a, that's a problem. And then the number one answer that almost everybody gives me, is, oh, you know, we have so many women entering now. And it's going to change. It just, you know, the time will change, will resolve all of these problems. It won't. It will not if, if we don't take initiatives. In journalism, for example, when I was working at the Blue House, the Blue House Press Corps is one of the most prestigious, and that's the stepping stone in, in the, in the um, journalism sector to an executive post. The number of females in covering the Blue House is, is really low compared to the number of females um, covering, for example, the culture desk. Mm. 
And so it's not really the number of women that enter the, the workforce. It's, it's where they go. Um, for the foreign ministry, if you, if you get into, you have to be able to get into the, to the Americas, the US, you know, the department that handles the US affairs in order to move up the ranks. If you're, if you're going to be in Southeast Asia for all of your, your career, you're never going to be, you know, um, you know, a big ambassador. So it, it's, it's that taking, you know, being aware that there is a real problem. And if you don't, we don't do something about it, this won't resolve the problem is, I think, a real issue. Thanks so much, uh, Gio, for that. I think um, that sort of leads in nicely to, to the next sort of point of discussion. Um, you've probably heard of uh, Sheryl Sandberg's um, approach to encouraging women to lean in. And, and I think what she means by that is to have more ambition and to build relationship capital with senior leaders within their workplaces. Um, the view is that women perhaps have uh, less confident and are less willing than men to take risks in their career paths. And, and perhaps men more than women recognize the importance of networking and um, mentoring in, in sort of elevating their personal profile, um, developing their brand and, and finding allies and champions to, to help them move up in their careers. Do, do you think this is a fair assessment, and, and, and particularly for women professionals in Korea. And, and what do you think the difference is between the work environment in Korea and places like Canada, the UK, or Hong Kong? And I just wonder if I could um, ask Dewey to, to comment on that, having had that experience of working in uh, both Korea and Hong Kong. Thanks so much, Sarah. This question is a difficult one, and this one is one you know, that I have been thinking for many years now, and I am not sure if I have actually uh, found the answer for myself yet, as to whether women are less confident, whether or not. Mm. Um, I, I, I do not agree with that. I think it's just the way we think is very different from how guys think. Mm. Um, whereas I think, and I typically, I, I, I hate speaking in general sense because everyone is different. But I think guys are more forthcoming in their thoughts, with their initial thoughts. Whereas female, I think we tend to mull over things, make sure that it makes sense in our head first, and then speak up. So naturally, that takes more time, and sometimes that ha that that results in guys actually getting more chances than females because we hold it hold back. Not because we are less confident, but we just want to think a bit more about it before we speak about it. Um, and uh, are, are we willing to take risks um, less so than than guys? I'm not sure. Um, I've always been up for challenges, um, so I think it's more uh, more of a personality issue. That said, I think for those of you who are listening, I just think it's very, very, very important for any female professional to have a supportive husband. Um, one senior female partner once told me it's actually better not to have a husband if he's not supportive. Um, I agree with that. Um, so if you want to become a successful professional, you better have a, um, a husband who's a partner who's, who's very supportive. Um, because at times my husband actually helped me take risks, telling me that I can do it. And I don't think it was necessarily my husband, but you need someone. Um, so it's sort of like opposite of leaning in. If someone needs to tell you, you can do it. We support each other. And I think oftentimes guys have more of their mates telling that they can do it, even though they won't say it like that. Whereas I think women, we are less so. Um, and networking, I think it's for both personality. I personally am very introverted, so I tend to not to network. And not that I do not enjoy speaking to my clients, but I tend to not to network, you know, have drinks um, and whatnot. But I've seen female lawyers who are very outgoing and love to network. But comparing Hong Kong and Korea, um, so I was in Hong Kong when I was a new mom uh, with a newborn with my first daughter who is now 10 years old. Um, in American age. Um, so in Hong Kong, we have domestic helpers. Um, 
And I think they are really great. Um, if you want to be a successful professional, to have someone who's almost your wife, in my view, to, to help you raise your kid, um, you know, look after the, uh, your house when you're gone, etc. So it was relatively easier, in my view. And when I moved back to Korea, um, so domestic helpers, um, at least like Filipino, Filipino nannies are not uh, allowed for Korean nationals. I actually found that very hard having to find new nannies, you know, um, and whatnot. So I think being a working mom um, is a lot more difficult in Korea um, than being one in Hong Kong, because in Hong Kong, there are readily accessible helps, whereas in Korea, it's not the case. So that I think that also results in women not being able to network because between you and your husband, you are um, expected to spend more time with your kids, be the main person looking after the kids. If something goes wrong with the kids, people will readily point fingers at you. So you don't want that to happen. So you don't really have time to network in my view. So I personally have my career and my kids and my family, but I, I don't really have time for network or play golf with you know male clients, to be honest. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, thanks, Judy. And and Graham, I know you've um, worked in uh, different parts of the world as well. Um, and I just wondered what your view is on this. Yeah, there's yeah, there's quite a, quite a few pieces, uh, quite a few pieces of the puzzle there. I mean, I I think I, I would just maybe start by echoing what 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 Judy said. I'm, I'm my and 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 I'm I'm in, on dangerous ground because I'm making observations about a space that I don't know. Um, but but I but my observation would be that actually there's there's another factor about determining whether women are less confident or less willing to put themselves out there. I think there's an interesting dynamic around back to this piece around bias and how we describe uh, women's behavior, whether it's in the workforce or, or, or elsewhere. And, and, you know, if I, I, there's been, you know, a few recent examples, it's, it goes back a couple of years, but I remember when Serena Williams um, slammed her tennis racket on the court, it, it, it was, it, it became quite a kind of interesting cultural moment because um, if it, many reflected that if it was a Roger Federer or a Rafael Nadal slamming his racket, it would have been uh, a, a moment of frustration or a moment of, of, of showing emotion. Um, when Serena Williams did it, it was uh, an angry black woman. And, and it was this sort of uh, both, both, both gender stereotype and, and you know, lack, lack of individuality around who she was as a person that I think is um, ever present. And so if we link it back to kind of, you know, our, our day-to-day uh, desires and ambitions, I, I think, you know, to show, um, you know, if a man shows ambition, a, a, a woman might be showing aggression. If a man shows enthusiasm, a woman might be loud. And it's these kind of descript, little subtle descriptive words that often get used, which I think are a, a, a big factor in, in perhaps why women may well be as as confident as men, but it's not as easy for them to navigate a way of how to how to show it off. Um, mm. I think when, when, if we if we look at the the, the cultural pieces, I, I think I'm just um, at the risk of, of uh, uh, celebrating my, my my own team. I do know I've got a lot of HSBC colleagues on, on the call, so I, I will just say like I, I think the 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 environment that um, our, our our female leaders in HSBC ha- help to create both as mentors, as sponsors, as as guides for the more junior staff is 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 really something that um, is inspirational, and it's it, it's why I, I I I love and can speak pretty passionately about this because I look across and um, I think you know that 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 point that was made earlier about like I don't see myself in, in the leaders. I I think. The, 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 the younger generation of, of women bankers at HSBC really can and do see um, see themselves in some of the some of the women leaders in our in our bank and if I just you know call out a couple of a couple of data points like last year um, 90 for 95 percent of our new joiners were female um, 56 percent of our promotions were female um, and 45% of our sort of associate directors and above are female. And so we, 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 we've, we, I think we're creating an environment that looks and feels like society and, and we, we have more to do. I mean, we have, we have, we have more to do. Um, but when I, when I reflect on the, the culture gap, I think one of the best ways to bridge that 
is for, for, for our, the organizations that we're working in to, to shine as examples. And it will, it will be an example to draw talent and it will be an example because it will, will show up in the bottom line as well. So there's multiple factors for why an inclusive and diverse workforce is the right answer. Brilliant, thanks, thanks, Graham. And Jihye, I just, just wondered if you could just comment on whether you um, think women have a confidence issue, um, are they less willing to, or less interested in networking than men? Um, what's, what's your view and your experience? Um, I think women, I mean, I, I think we all want to be successful. I mean, we also, you, we all want to be considered successes in life. Um, and, and it feels good to, when we do that. But I think for women in Korea, being su successful in life isn't equal to being successful in your career. Um, I think it is, it is, of course, being successful in, in your career is good, but also being successful in raising your kids and being, uh, you know, in being a good supporting wife to a successful husband is also sort of all wrapped up in there in how women are considered successful. Just taking my own personal perspective, you know, as a CNN correspondent, president of Arirang TV, on the whole, if a male was this, that would be considered pretty successful. I would not have to, you know, I would walk into any room and be considered one of the most, you know, uh, successful people in the room. But as a female, when I, and I, and I have three kids, so um, I, I know this pretty well. If I walk into my kids or if I walk into any you know, room full of women, the most successful woman is the woman, the mother of the, the, the first, you know, the top student of that class. It's not me. Um, and so I think, you know, working women deal with, with a lot more of different, I see Dewey laughing. So I, she definitely understands what I'm talking about. Um, it, 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 it's a more com it's a more complicated issue of what you know successful woman looks like in Korea. I think that sort of you know um, plays a lot into how women um, seek out uh, you know career goals and how far they're willing to go in terms of really being assertive and confident. Um, and so I see it from that perspective. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that insight. Um, I mean, just just moving um, a little bit more detail around the culture, um, the cultural environment in which we in which we operate. Um, as you will know, as senior executives, the importance of ESG is is rising. Um, women's inclusion in senior positions um, at uh, the C-suite is now becoming one of the major social and governance issues for companies in Korea. Um, but to have a, I would like to suggest that to have a meaningful reform, company culture would have to change um, where senior leaders are on board with the importance of this initiative. And I just wondered whether you could just share from your own industry perspective, some of the best practices and policies that you've seen that have been effective in changing company um, culture, making it more inclusive and, and encouraging and providing a platform for the next uh, generation of women leaders. And, and also, if you could just talk about your views around mentoring. As, as you know, the BCCK has very recently um, initiated a mentoring scheme. And we'd be interested in your views and whether it's um, easier or more difficult for Korean females to find mentors um, or, or even to mentor someone uh, themselves here in Korea. Sorry, a lot of questions in that um, in that area. <laughs> um, let me let me start with uh, Juhi, please. Thank you, Sam. Um, so, best practices and company policies. You know, as I mentioned, we take this very seriously, um, and we do have many initiatives, um, programs, and 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 whatnot to nurture our female lawyers. Um, but I think what I'm most proud is that is that the, the female representation um, in our senior management. So for example, our um, senior partner who's um, CEO equivalent in a company is Ada Mark Kuminski. 
Um, so first a senior partner. Um, our Asia uh, managing partner until very recently was Natalie Hobbs, um, who's also a uh, fem female, um, senior female partner. So I think, and, and, I, and head of our corporate practice um, is um, Sophie Matar, uh, who's also female as the name suggests, and dispute resolution, Jalika. Um, so I think having these senior figures to look up to, who makes you feel that you can actually have a family and have a career, um, I think that helps a lot. That gives, a, that gives female lawyers a lot of courage to, to just go for it. Um, and and it, it is not impossible. And that, that the firm will actually take steps to ensure that they get all the supports they need uh, to make it happen. So that, that's, that's what I'm really proud about uh, at Linklaters. Um, so I'll pause there uh, so others can speak as well, um, but happy to speak on other points um, if, if there's time. Okay, great, thanks, thanks. And Graham, could, could I just bring you in on, on that question or those questions, I should say? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, I was just trying to unpick which one. So I think if I if I speak to, um, you know, best practices, um, again, I'll kind of call back on that our, our balance group, which um, is notably led by by um, uh, a couple of senior leaders in our business. Um, but they, but it is not a, you know it's 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 not structural like they, they've chosen to volunteer their time, as have the other 85, 85 colleagues. Um, and uh, through that program, there are, there are a wide array of activities. And, and just to touch on a couple of the sort of headline pieces, we do a diversity inclusion, career development, corporate responsibility, work-life balance, women in leadership, and an HSBC library. So that's sort of how the, how the team is, is structured and organized. And then each of those subgroups initiate activity um, uh, to, to sort of drive, drive the agenda forward. Um, I, I think it's, it's sort of, you know, that, that, that is a really key component part. I think, you know, we talked a little bit about those about the processes and procedures, which I, I, I believe very strongly are, 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 are really important aspect of, of minimizing uh, bias that exists in the organization. And then, it, and, then, and then it's also kind of toned from the top. I mean, these are senior female leaders who, who are running that program, but it also comes straight from our CEO and from, from our, our Exco as well. Who um, who are very active in our mentorship program. Um, we we also recognize the difference, and I think this is an important distinction: the difference between mentoring and sponsoring. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, mentorship is, is 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 helping to to guide colleagues and respond to the questions that they may have and give counsel and advice. Mm -hmm. um, sponsorship is saying, I think this person is excellent, and I'm going to help find their next role for them and advance their career. And I've, I've certainly seen, you know, more of that. I think there's more to do in that sponsorship space. I think, you know, if, if we think about how to go and, and continue to progress the agenda, if you formally say, Exco, everyone on the senior leadership, I want you to sponsor, you know, two, two, two women. Uh, and if you don't have them today, then go, go and find them. And, 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 I, and these are just like, these are just nudges. They're not, they're, again, they're not kind of transformational. The transformation will know will take place when there are no longer any of these initiatives. It's like, we don't, we don't track, I mean, I don't know if you can tell because I'm, it's, it's kind of going gray, but we don't track how many redheads we have in the organization because it's just not relevant. And, and, and we track capability and we track all these other things. And so we, I, I genuinely believe what we are working towards is a removal of all these programs, but in the interim, we have to introduce them to bust these these existing barriers and, and, and a lot of those things that we've that we've already spoken about, I, I'd like to just, sorry just to dwell on for a second. But there's one extra other point which I think is quite important and relevant to this. Yeah, I, I think there's both an interesting new challenge and a, a really compelling opportunity that exists as a result of the pandemic. Um, one is this notion of the future of work and how mm -hmm. how are we going to um, how are we going to uh, operate in a sort of hybrid environment? And there are pluses uh, because it, it you know, increases uh, greater flexibility. Julie and I are both uh, working from home today. We were talking about that before the session. Um, so how do we, that, that's great. And how do we kind of progress that? But we also know that thus far the pandemic has, has disproportionately impacted child, child 
uh, carers and child carers are predominantly the, 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 the women in the household. So, so there's, there's, there's an opportunity there, um, but there's also a challenge and, and there's a danger that however this, we, we work our way through this pandemic, there's a danger that we end up having um, almost a two tier uh, where you've got sort of males working in the office and women working remotely at home. And, and, and we have to be really conscious mm-hmm. and aware of, 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 of how to avoid any stigmas associated with that. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, thanks, Graham. And, and Gia, if I could just bring you in um, on um, on my previous questions, but also just if you could share with us your your experience of working for a multinational in CNN and as well as um, you know heading up Erang, do you think there is a um, culture difference uh, between Korea and 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 other uh, companies um, elsewhere? And if so, how how do we change that? Thank you, Sam. Um, I definitely agree with what what you know both Julie and Graham um, pointed out. Um, in terms of you know the the cultural difference is sort of like how you how you look at women. Um, you know, as president of Adirang TV, um, you know I I get involved in um, interviewing and selecting um, recruits, and so. When you, when in the process of getting, and, and you know, there's there's a panel, you know, when you do the final interview, for example, there's always a panel of, it's usually me, and I sort of, you know, even though I'm CEO, I represent women, and the others are all men, and we do the interview. Um, but whenever there's a woman, uh, my male colleagues always bring up the point, is she, is she married? Is she single? Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, the assumption is if she's single, she's going to get married soon. And if she's going to get married and if she's married, she's going to have a child soon. Yeah. You know, it's, it's that, you know, process of looking at a female as a candidate in a different way, um, you know, as a potential uh, a, uh, a, a employee who's going to take three months, six months, a year to two years off um, to have a have a child. And so. You know, and, and once a, a, a woman does that, you know, it takes two years off because, she, you know, a lot of women do take a year or two off and, and, you know, they may have two children. And so that means four years off um, and they come back into the workforce. They're not on the same track as they left. There's no way that they're on the same track. Um, and so that kind of perception, I think, is still um, very prevalent in a, a Korean structure. In the U.S., you would never be able to, you know, think about that. You know, if you had a child, you know, and, and that may be actually bear worse for women in the U.S., but in a corporate environment, it's actually not that bad a thing that you don't, you're not perceived like that, mm-hmm. that you are expected, even if you have a child, take a little time off, but to go straight back, come straight back to work, which in the, in Korea is a different kind of, you know, perception. So, so there's mm-hmm. that. And I think also to um, the point in which, you know, um, work life, and, and that's why work life, you know, there are a lot of programs in the U- in Korea where, you know, you, you think of your female uh, colleagues and I've been invited to uh, some of them to give lectures and meet women, but it's always focused on work-life balance. Mm. it's not so much towards how to get assertive you know and Mm. and and i i agree work-life balance as i said very important for women so working mothers so it's it's great to know how to you know um navigate these kind of things um both at home and at work but that that shouldn't be the only thing to you know really um get women involved in Mm. but okay just one final point now i'll shut up um, in, in the U, it, but to do sort of the, the sponsoring that, that Graham was talking about in Korea is tricky. It, it is a real difficult thing because believe it or not, in Korea, a lot of women, men feel that the bias is against them, that there's a, 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 a bias against men in Korea. And so if you single out women, They'll feel that it's it's an it's unfair, and they they will they will complain and they will not be on your. I mean, look at the the how young men in Korea have become conservative, and I think one of that is the anti-feminist you know movement. And so you have to be very aware of 
how the, the um, general environment and thinking um, is at the moment. That's it. Thanks, thanks, Gia. And just, I mean, just following up with you on, on, on that point, actually, I mean, just talking about sponsors and champions um, and, and, and the environment in which we're, we're operating here in Korea. I mean, did you, did you yourself um, have a sponsor or a champion to help you, um, you know, give you a boost in your career? And, and, and given um, sort of, the concerns that you've just expressed about, you know, uh, male Koreans um, feeling as if it's unfair. Um, do you, as a female senior professional, actually sponsor or champion younger um, female professionals? Um, when I was moving up the ranks, I didn't have a specific, well, actually I did. I mean, there were a lot of male executives who felt that a young, you know, female um, was something unusual. I mean, I was pretty much the only person. Um, I didn't have a female role model. Um, when I became mm. spokesman for the Blue House, they actually said, okay, um, who's, your, who's your role model? And there was no role model in, in Korea. So I picked the woman from the US, you know, drama West Wing okay. um, as, my, as my role model. Um, but anyway, uh, but, you know, as Julie said, you know, the, the, the biggest support came from my husband. Um, and in a way, you know, that sort of he was mentoring and sponsoring at the same time in terms of his support. And so I think that was um, for me in, in an era where there were very few female executives on top. That was difficult um, for a female executive to mentor another female is much easier. Mm. You know, in, in Korean society, it's sort of, you know, almost, I guess it's, I guess it's because male executives sponsor males and, and they, they consider that okay. And so when a female executive sponsors or mentors a female, that's okay. You know, that's sort of considered normal. And so um, I've been able to do a little bit of that. Now that I'm out of the corporate world, I can, you know, have well, it, part of what I teach, but other women who, who are in journalism, I want to move up, want to think about how to, how to, you know, get in, deal with the work-life balance, for example, um, come to me and I, I'm very, you know, open about it and we talk a lot. And so I sort of try to work them through it. Um, so that's sort of the way that it goes for me. And, and do you sponsor male um, executives? I actually do, which is weird, but uh, male men come to me too, young men come to me too. Um, and if I, you know, and I think they have a certain amount of, um, you know, I judge by the amount of social good they, they want to do. Uh, and if I figure that's, that's what they have that, then I, I try to do as much as I can. And that's sponsoring in terms of finding them, you know, getting them, uh, meetings with people, having, you know, doing a lunch with somebody, you know, things like that, and, and then including them. So that's the kind of sponsorship that I like to sort of be able to do. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much. And um, can I come to you, Graham, next as, as our male panelist and, and just, you know, have you had uh, a sponsor who supported you in your career? And, and, and what role, if any, have you, have you had in sponsoring others? Um, yeah, I, I, so I, I, I have, um, uh, I, I had, my, my old boss was very much uh, a, sp a sponsor of mine and I believe would, 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 would still be. Um, I think it, in terms of my sponsorship of, of, of colleagues in, in Korea, I, I mean, uh, how do I put it? I, I would say, I think I, I, think I, I do. I, I'm I'm very active with 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 my colleagues, both people who work for me, and colleagues who reach out. And I've got a number of of ongoing relationships. And 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 some of them, you know, I I find it a little bit challenging to sponsor someone not in my structure, um, if I'm honest. And so I, I think I think in those environment in those cases, um, and this is probably you know advice I'd give just just more broadly for for, for colleagues. Um, in any event, but I think you, you've got to figure out ways to show your your contribution professionally 
uh, in order for people to be willing to go into a sponsorship type relationship with you. It, it, it's, it's, you know, and, and, and we've talked about it. Like there's, there's lo- oftentimes I'll have guys who, who reach out and uh, are, are keen to have a, a, a personal relationship and a professional one and, and then move, merge that into sponsorship quite quickly, just because we've, we've gone out and had a couple of beers together. And, and, I, and I'm like, well, no, you, you kind of have to prove that you're 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 a capable executive in order for that to transition from oh this is a friend of mine to I would be an advocate for you hiring this person those are two very different distinct and I find often we we, we collect often people integrate and merge those and and I'm I'm quite uh, clear in in my guidance both to, to younger you know professionals be it female or male that if if it's going to be a sponsorship type of relationship. Um, looking for a chance to work in, as an, in an STA or looking for a chance to a short-term assignment, looking for a chance to do a project that runs across functions, any opportunity that colleagues get to be able to show their contribution professionally will give them a better chance to identify potential sponsors in the future because people can see, oh, this is what that person did and they did it really, really well. Um, mentorship is different and I mentor a, a large number of colleagues um, and that's something that, that, that I, you know, get a great deal of, 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 of passion and, and fulfillment out of. So I'll continue to do that. Great. Thanks. And, and Juhi, have you, uh, have you yeah, had a sponsor sure. in your life? Yeah, I've had great sponsors in my career. Um, and um, and I, I think I talked about that briefly. Um, so I'll talk more about my own sponsorship. So, so I think when it comes to sponsorship, I think I'm almost gender neutral. Um, in a way that I set aside their gender, but I look at their talent. So I, and I love real talent. So regardless of, it does, it, it almost doesn't matter whether it's a woman or a man. Um, if they're a great lawyer, if they have potentials, I would sponsor them. So, so yeah, there are, there are both male lawyers and female lawyers that I'm sponsoring at the moment. And when it comes to mentorship, as Graham says, I, I love doing it as well. Um, I think mentorship, you can mentor regardless of whether the person has talents or not, because um, it's something different um, from sponsor- sponsorship in my view. Brilliant, thanks. And I, I, I just got one final question for, for you um, all on the panel. What is the one piece of advice that you would give to an aspiring uh, female professional um, to help her um, forward her career? Jihei, can I come to you first, please? Uh, that's hard. I would just say it's okay to want, want it all. You know, the career, the family, and everything. You know, you all you deserve to be happy and whatever makes you happy, you deserve to go after it. So go after it with, with gusto and confidence. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks. And uh, Juhi. What, what would you um, advise? Thank you, Sam. It is a difficult question. Um, I would just say, put everything in. Um, I, I think probably this is the first time that I'm actually disagreeing with GA. I'm not sure if, if one can have it all, but I think it's possible to have both successful career and family. So you can have the two. Um, so go for it. Um, and as we said, lean in, get support. Um, yeah, and go for it. Great. And, and finally, Graham. I'll, I'll probably run with the theme then and say, don't, don't, don't apologize for your ambition. Um, be unapologetically ambitious. And, and you know, it, it, that, that very simple but familiar saying, if you don't ask, you don't get. And so make sure you stick your hand out, make sure you push yourself out there, make sure you look at the mirror. And, and, and this is for myself as well, every time I get up in the morning, <laughs> make sure you look at the mirror and say, you know, how, how am I going to uh, be better? How am I going to push myself forward? Um, and raise your hand when, when, when those opportunities arise. Brilliant. Thanks so much, everyone, for your contributions and, and for, for signing this webinar off in such a positive note. Can I hand back to uh, Sean now, please? I think we're we're coming close, very close to time on, on this webinar. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone, and, and, and Sam as well. And actually, you're bang on the end time. So 
I'm reluctant not to have any questions just because a couple of people have asked. So I'll, I'm looking at the participants and people are not dropping off. So I think whilst we have that, uh, their attention and they're here, why don't we just do maybe one question for, for each of the, the speakers. So the first one, Chui, is actually, I, I guess it's coming from a female Korean lawyer uh, who's on the call. And it's a very sort of specific question that's, um, I think she's been very impressed with, with what you're doing and basically asking what would your advice be to a Korean qualified lawyer about the potential of working at a global law firm? I guess that's in the context of, you know, uh, sort of uh, ability to, to be recognized and elevated potentially more quickly than a domestic law firm. And obviously I'm not sure you can speak exactly to that sort of comparison, but nonetheless, uh, what, what are your thoughts or your advice to, to someone like that? Thank you. Um, it's, this is the same Hyo Young Kang Bionosanim that I know. He's actually a very senior male um, oh, partner. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Kang Bionosanim, for raising this question. Um, I think, I think, in short, just put everything in, in doing what you love to do. Um, so I love my job. I love the work that I do. I love the people that link matters. Um, at the same time, I love my family. So I devote all my time and energy and attention to my career, link leaders, work, and my kids and my family and my husband. Um, so yeah, find what makes you happy, uh, what you love, and just go for it again. Okay, excellent, thank you. And then I, another one is, um, you know, it's actually my question because, uh, you know, we've run these types of um, webinars and events over the last two, three years. And one thing that's very, very clear is it's the, the most highly female attended events are, are these. And actually very few men attend these events. So now, of course, in, in a lot of senses, maybe it's directed at advice for females. But nonetheless, the huge stakeholder here is also, you know, the perception and thoughts of males here. So I think for you, Graham. How do, what do you feel, you know, you or what would be your advice to maybe males that are not even on this call to say, look, this is why, you know, you ought to be involved and why this is not just a, you know, a medium for advice for, for female employees? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'd go back to where I started. I think, I think um, what, you know, in, in many of the... Um, inequities in, 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 in our professional lives and we're, we're speaking to gender today, but there's, there's, there's many of them. And, and um, you know, there's a common refrain that's, you know, silence um, can, 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 can have some element of culpability. And, and I think being a vocal ally um, and, and showing up and participating and um, most importantly, listening and, and absorbing and understanding the challenges that our, our colleagues um, face is ultimately going to help us to have a better, more inclusive working environment, um, and and I and I genuinely believe that that leads to to much better outcomes um, for the organization. So, to me, it's a really simple calculus. Like if if you're a a male and you don't understand that this is an important agenda item for your organization, um, then you're you're missing something very important. Okay, thank you very much. And actually, with, with great timing, just a quick one for you as well, Chia. So we have um, someone on the call who's in uh, working actually in women's football in Korea. So that's, uh, it's not every day that that happens for us. So that, that's very, very interesting. And actually, he says the majority of women that uh, he's working with are aspirant and, you know, do want to move forward, but they're um, worried about the perception that they might be seen to be, I guess, causing trouble, as, as he calls it, or I think, you know, Bear in mind that there is a, a gender gap, and particularly what I assume is a predominantly male-dominated environment. So what is it that uh, we can do to sort of encourage women to find sort of professional support, try to break this gender bias, bearing in mind that, you know, maybe there is a, a sort of negative perception that if you do push against that, that you are a troublemaker, which could inhibit, I guess, opportunity. How, how do you strike that balance? That's a, that's a hard one, but I, I and that's um, one that's very fundamental to Korean gender issues. Um, but I, I just want to say that you know you you it's not it's not a fight. You know it, it's you're not taking something away 
or you don't want to, you know, or you've not, you know, someone else is not taking it away from you. If you if you approach it from a contentious point of view, then it's and it becomes um, very difficult to get ahead, and you get that perception. I think what we need to do is really be able to communicate our, you know, the the different kind of perspectives to the other side. And I found I have found that when I get young men and women. Um, together or separately and really ask about their perception of the other side, it's really wrong and they don't know that it's wrong. Um, and, but once they understand why the other side you know, feels the way or you know, approaches it the way they do, then there's a, lot, there's a lot more opportunity for things to get better. So that would be my uh, thing is to communicate better. Right. Okay, that, that, that's great. And then also then last one for our moderator. Sam, you thought you dodged a bullet, right? But I uh, just found enough time. So, you know, I, um, I'm aware, obviously, the British Council is a kind of sort of public-private type uh, structure. So your, I think, involvement and um, understanding of particularly the British government would be, um, is, is, a, is a good one. So what do you think very broadly, and is a very broad question, but to what extent does the government need to be involved in these types of, of initiatives because we have obviously a lot of private sector initiatives here and also you know it's been mentioned this is about promoting people with competency and not not about you know gender and creating equal opportunity but how much of this you know do you think work needs to involve the government and, and if that's the case in what sort of way um i mean i just very quickly i think it's i think it's really important that um the government leads by example. And um, so we will run a number of um, programs um, focusing on gender equality and um, and providing opportunities for, for women. And uh, we can only do that if, if we create a, a relationship of trust and and show that we're we're walking the talk. So um, from a British Council perspective, we need to, as I say, lead by example as well. Um, so that would be my um, the, my very quick response. Very important, and um, and also provides opportunities as well for for uh, for gender equality to become more mainstream, more openly discussed, and more widely understood and and, and um, improved. Okay. Yeah. I totally agree, and that's why after this call, I look forward to going to my all-female staff and having a very productive <laughs> day at work. So someone's asked where this will be available. We'll be putting this up on YouTube and also sending the link to everyone that's attending. And, you know, we are really happy with that you've had so many attendees. I guess this, this is the highest this year for sure in terms of this uh, webinar, so that speaks to the very real uh, attention on this issue. So that's fantastic. Thanks again to the speakers. Thanks again to Sam, fantastic moderation and really appreciate your time. As the Chamber, we're super excited about this mentoring program that we're beginning. It is, and it's uh, just its beginnings, but you know, this is an issue that uh, we're very passionate about and will, will be maintained. So for those of you that are interested in doing anything like that, please do contact us. But without further ado, I'd like to leave you to enjoy the rest of your day. So thank you everyone and have a good day. Thank you all. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Bye.